So I'm going to change a little bit topic and talk about uh, the modeling work that we did on this platform and see how models can help you in um, uh, taking advantage of the flexibility of the platform and what can be done there. Um, so what we're we going to see? Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the principles, uh, the high-level description of this model, uh, how we verified it, how it works. And then uh, we're going to see, uh, more importantly, uh, how, what can you do with a model and why a model is helpful uh, when you uh, use a platform or when you customize it or when you develop it. So this is a, an image of the uh, eval board of the beamformer chip of the OTBF-103 uh, from Ottawa. And then we see here the uh, uh, representation of the model uh, for uh, the transmit and the receive um, component of the uh, beamformer chip. Uh, when we developed this model, the first uh, guideline that we followed was uh, one of the best practices from the software world that is uh, separate the device under test from the test bench. So in our case, we have uh, our OTBF, uh, the transmitter and the receiver part at the center, and we have a test bench uh, that excites the, uh, the component. And the first thing that we need to observe is that we decided to have electrical interfaces in, vo in the voltage and the current domains for the model itself. Why is that important? Because if we want to terminate the transmitter, the receiver, or an antenna, or on another RF component, it's important to take into account the impedance mismatches. So we should, uh, for this reason, we developed a model that has interfaces in the electrical domains rather than the, the signal flow domain. Uh, the model is based on measured data. So we used a lot of the characterization data from the um, for the device itself, and it allows you to configure the operating frequency, the VGA, the phase shifts, uh, taking into account a lot of the imperfection. Uh, the test bench allows you to change the stimulus, so you can do CW measurement on your device, but you can also stream signals. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it today, or well, actually, I'm going to talk about it today, but not in this workshop. So you will see a lot of uh, results of streaming 5G signals and uh, satellite communication systems, uh, DVBS 2 x uh, in a workshop that will be um, at, in the afternoon. Uh, but essentially, you can try different stimulus. You can change some of the global parameters. For example, you can say, uh, I want to operate at different uh, frequencies. And then at the output of the test bench, you get uh, different uh, um, metrics. So if, for example, you can see what is, uh, what is the spectrum of my signal, what is the CLR, uh, what is the EVM, uh, if you are interested in that. Um, as well as you can look at a more specific spot uh, spot measurements such as IP3 or noise figure or gain. Uh, one of the things that is important is that when we developed these models, uh, we adopted uh, an architecture for the model that is not necessarily representative of the architecture of the chip itself. Uh, and the reason why we did this was to uh, make sure that the model was correct, but also was fast to simulate or as fast as possible. Uh, so what you see here is that um, um, for on the on the top side, you see the transmit path. We model the splitter. Um, at the input of the splitter, we model the S11 of the uh, of the transmit uh, on the OTBF103. We have beam uh, beam shifter uh, phase shifters for implementing uh, beam steering. Uh, we have a variable gain amplifier that allows you to change the VGA code. And then we have a, a block that essentially is a, is a sort of a macro block that represents the uh, uh, TX characteristics in terms of S parameters as well as non-linearity. So this will take into account frequency dependency on the gain, but also frequency independence on the output impedance. And the um, structure is mirrored on the receiver side. In practice, what you see is that uh, the model is, is a block. Uh, if you look under the mask, you recognize the structure that they just covered, uh, repeated eight times because we have eight channels on the OTBF. And uh, if you double click on the block, you see some of the global parameters. So you can change what is the operating frequencies, what are the uh, VGA codes that you apply, what are the phase shifts, and you get immediate um, feedback on uh, what are the applied uh, phase shifts, including quantizations and the I and Q codes that are applied in terms of uh, uh, VGA codes. And um, actually, uh, well, from the block itself, you can plot 
DS parameter characteristics, and you can uh, get information such as what is the gain, what is the 1 dB compression point, what is the IP3 for this specific operating frequency or at which the device uh, operates. And this is just a, I could say, a convenient um, uh, visualization that helps you say, if I operate in this condition with this VGA code, how my transmitter, what are the my transmitter characteristics, rather than going back to the data sheet. Um, the receiver model is very similar. Uh, so again, you look under the, uh, under the block, you will see the architecture that I just described. Uh, you double click on the block itself, and you have uh, uh, the ability to configure the operating frequency, the VGA code, the phase shifts, and again, plot the characteristics, um, including also the noise figure for the receiver that is particularly important at the operating frequency of interest. So everything is frequency dependent. So you can change the operating frequency, but uh, as you stream signals, you will also see the um, selectivity and the dispersion of the S parameters impacting the results. Of course, we verified the model. Uh, so we did lots and lots of uh, simulations uh, with different test benches to verify that the model uh, predicted correctly uh, the gain, the IP3, the noise figure, the S parameters, and also streaming um, modulated waveforms such as uh, OFDM standard signals, uh, what is the characteristics uh, of, the, uh, of the output of the transmitter and the receiver in terms of EVM or ACLR. So this is an example of uh, some of the verification that we did on the transmitter model. So in this case, we streamed an OFDM signal. You can see the ACLR in the spectrum here. Uh, we measure the EVM using uh, essentially a reference OFDM uh, uh, receiver, uh, in this case of operating on a 100 megahertz bandwidth. But we actually done a lot of simulation also with larger bandwidth, up to 400 megahertz for different, uh, uh, also standard signals such as uh, 5G FR2 signals as well as um, DVB-S2X signals. Uh, another example of performance verification on the receiver, so we verified a different for example, at different frequencies, what is the IP3, as well as we verified uh, what are the S parameters and how they compare with the, um, uh, with the measurements, essentially, with the reference. And uh, last but not least, we announced the model in such a way that it could be connected to any arbitrary uh, antenna array system. And this is starts to become a little bit more interesting. So in this case, it's just a one OTBF uh, transmitter connected uh, to an array of eight elements. Um, and um, this allows us to take into account, uh, to steer the beam in different direction and also measure the EIRP. So again, we verified that the EIRP is what we are expecting compared to um, uh, essentially uh, measurements as well as uh, I can say the budget calculations that you would normally do in this scenario. But you can also verify already what is the uh, what are the side lobes, for example, or do I need to apply tapering, uh, this type of considerations. And um, yeah, so let's see a little bit about the technology that is behind the model to understand how it works and what it allows you to, um, to do this model. Uh, first of all, when you uh, when you develop a model like this that is meant to model the signal uh, path of, of your system, um, the model needs to have one specific characteristic. It has to allow you to, uh, needs to be fast. I mean, if, it's not, if you have a model that is very accurate but very slow, it becomes unusable. So it has to be as fast as possible to take into account all the things that matter, like, such as frequency dependency, impedance mismatches, and nonlinearity and noise, but it still has to be usable when you stream a millisecond of data, for example. It needs to enable you to, um, uh, to measure things such as EVM. And measuring EVM is actually nothing but trivial uh, because it requires a reasonable amount of data. Uh, so you need a, a tool that allows you to trade off this uh, um, fidelity in the sense that you don't want to operate at the transistor level. You don't want uh, a, a model that represents actually necessarily uh, the implementation of the hardware, uh, but it still allows you to predict the performance of the hardware that can be used at the system level. So for this, we use the uh, RDRF block set uh, that is uh, a model uh, and that is a product from MathWorks that uh, enables uh, the simulation of RF systems. And the uh, RF block set provides and supports circuit envelope. So circuit envelope is a simulation technology that has been around for a while. It's um, 
it enables multi-carrier simulation, is based on harmonic balance. And the benefits that it offers is that, essentially, when applied at the system level, together with behavioral models, provides a trade-off between uh, um, an equivalent basement approach and a real passband approach. That is, uh, 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 one is faster but less accurate, doesn't allow you to look what happens outside the bandwidth of interest, uh, and the real passband is uh, probably more accurate but enormously slower because you, it requires a very small simulation time step. Uh, when it comes to modeling the antennas, we use the full wave electromagnetic analysis. So you saw when I connected our array of eight elements, actually what's behind the scenes is a full wave electromagnetic analysis of that antenna arrays. This means that we take into account the S parameters, the near field coupling, so the leakage in between the antenna elements, but also we take into account uh, effects of coupling in between the elements in terms of field. And we also take into account frequency dependency. So because the system, like when was saying, operates a, a, on very large bandwidth, um, you design an antenna maybe to operate at 25 gigahertz, but you maybe might be operating your system at 24 gigahertz, then the impedance, the pattern will differ. And once you combine your OTBF or your phase shift, uh, your beamformer, together with the antenna, you need to take into account this combination of effects. And this is, can be done thanks to the use of electromagnetic analysis. Uh, very good. So now uh, let's go to the meat of, uh, of, uh, of this part of the presentation that is uh, the specific uh, of the models. What can you do with such a model? Uh, we, have, we have a model of the beamformer that is one tile, if you like, in a bigger system. Now what? Uh, some of the things that, you can, that we did and uh, that can be done is uh, to use this model, for example, to model the AIM card. So here you see uh, on the left-hand side the AIM card with the two chips, with the two beamformers uh, and the couplers and the splitters and the feed uh, points on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side you see the switches as well as the antennas. Um, so what we modeled here, you see, is the two transmitter and the two receivers that are representative uh, each of, um, of one OTBF, one beamformer. In the middle, we actually have um, uh, the couplers and the splitters modeled through the S parameters. This allows us to take into account signal integrity issues, uh, dispersion, impedance mismatches when combined with uh, the OTBF model. Um, we, um, we also have uh, used um, as parameters model for the switches itself. So you see that the, or the, the beamformer is actually um, properly terminated both at the input and at the output with the S parameters of the components. And then we have the uh, antenna array, some uh, 16 elements antenna array, um, terminating uh, the two uh, components. And in this case, on the transmit side, um, on, sorry, on the receive side, we can use plane wave excitation. Uh, in other way, imagine a, a wave, um, a, a plane wave of uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, energy impinging onto your antenna array, coming maybe from different directions. Uh, that allows you to take into account, of course, the direction of arrival uh, as well as the polarization mismatch, if there is any polarization mismatch between transmitter and receiver. And on the transmit side, essentially, uh, we model the antenna, both the um, horizontal and vertical elements. This allows you to look, for example, where we are steering the beam and measure the EIRP. Um, so this is one of the models that we created um, to represent the AIM card. Effectively, though, um, and then we very, verified the results. We did lots of, lots of analysis, lots of simulation. Um, so in this case, you see, we just use the idea uh, cross dipole elements, and we saw okay, what happens when uh, we control the beam? Just verify that you land on your feet. Are we steering? What happens when we steer the uh, horizontal element? What uh, happens when we steer the vertical elements? And uh, this allows you also to, for example, to experiment with different type of antennas. So this is very simple because it's just cross dipoles, but you might operate, for example, with um, uh, patch antennas that are uh, uh, fed at different. Uh, um, different points, dual, dual polarized, essentially. And then um, what else did we do? So we did first the experiment with uh, ideal elements, and then actually we integrated the measurements of the actual uh, antennas that are on the aim card themselves. So we used the um, uh, measurement results 
and the electromagnetic analysis results uh, to integrate directly the um, horizontal and vertical patterns or the patterns of the horizontal and vertical elements, I should say, together with our model. And again, you see, first we have a reference and then we use the measurement and we verify if the results are meaningful and consistent. Um, so we can use the model further. So here, for example, uh, effectively you don't use um, uh, quite a transmit and receive on the same board as such, but you want to think about a transmitter and a receiver that are maybe on different locations. So we also created models separate for uh, the transmitter on the AIM card itself. Uh, so you see at the input uh, um, just before the two uh, BFICs, you see the a subset of the S parameters of the, of the couplers. You still see the S parameters of the switches as well as the antenna. This allows us to verify if you can steer the beam in transmit mode. And similarly, on the receiver side, we experimented with different uh, uh, excitations, different plane waves coming from different directions and verified uh, that the pattern and the power uh, levels are consistent. So good, so we went from a single BFIC to two BFICs on an AIM card, taking into account the um, uh, essentially signal integrity effects through the uh, combiners, uh, through the switches, uh, taking into account uh, uh, impedance mismatches, dispersion, and frequency dependency. Now what's next? Well, we can actually start, um, uh, again, going more complex connecting the transmit and the receiver, and maybe uh, taking into account uh, uh, an arbitrary channel model, uh, and see how, uh, do, do I, if I transmit this signal, do I receive it? Um, do I, uh, what, how much power do I receive? And uh, what if there is, um, uh, essentially, if there is polarization mismatch, if there is different direction of uh, arrival and departure, if there is, um, um, what is the impact of noise as well as non-linearity. And uh, we also use the models like this uh, to stream, uh, like I was saying before, 5G and satellite communication systems. Um, but um, I'm not going to show it here because we're going to talk a little bit later in, um, in these afternoon workshops uh, and show a lot of results that we did in terms of uh, streaming signals. Okay, so now we have um, um, the, the model of the BFICs on the AIM card. We have all the components of the AIM card. Uh, we can look at the link. Then what's next? Uh, we can go even more complex. Um, so when introduced uh, the PAM module, where we have uh, not eight, not 16, but 128 antennas. So we actually modeled uh, the entire system by putting together eight of these AIM cards that we just modeled here and also model the combiner card in terms of uh, potential losses and um, losses and dispersion, as well as uh, an 128 antenna element array uh, in dual polarized or 64 times two. And so what you see here in the animation is what happens to the beam as we steer the beam formers in different direction uh, along the azimuth and the elevation uh, uh, plane. Again, looking at the results, uh, so let's look at um, um, some, uh, some of the results in, in 2D that maybe are easier to digest. So this is uh, some of the uh, beam scanning patterns the, for the full PAM system, um, exciting only the, vertical, the horizontal polarized elements. Uh, when excited with ideal elements, so with cross dipoles, uh, so you see um, scanning on the azimuth direction on the left and, and on the elevation direction on the right. And um, the comparison of the azimuth scanning uh, when using measured patterns, uh, comparing with the results that Wen just showed before, how comparable they are with the actual measurements, essentially. So using the data for each of the individual antenna elements. So we see this on the azimuth direction, we see this on the uh, elevation direction, for the, always for the horizontally polarized elements. And we have done verification also, of course, for the vertical polarized elements. First, using ideal elements. You always want to have a reference. You always want to know that you are landing on your feet uh, when you do this type of analysis. And then using, uh, essentially, compare using the data coming from the, uh, from the electromagnetic analysis of the embedded antenna in the M card and comparing with the actual measurement. And it, again, the model compares favorably, uh, both uh, on the azimuth scanning as well as the elevation scanning. Um, so in summary, um, uh, what we covered today was a lot. So 
um, the point that I really want to bring in here is that models can really help you when you deal with such complex systems in the sense that you can really build your understanding on how the system works starting from its basic component, in this case the beamformer, and then adding some of the, um, in, can I say, some of the effects that the board or the integrated system might add. So we went from the single beamformer to the aim card uh, to the full PAM system, always using behavioral models that allow you to verify that if the system works as you expect. And as you, can, as you saw, I mean, at every step we verified that the results were consistent with what we were expecting, or um, they were, um, how can I say, um, meaningful, let's say. So in summary, um, the BFSC model is based on actual measurements. It reproduced the lab results, as we saw. We, um, we verified it at every step. We built the different test benches. We integrated it with antenna elements and array elements using electromagnetic analysis as well as measurements. And we used this for end-to-end -end simulation and to take advantage of um, uh, the flexibility of the platform in case you want to customize it further. Of course, uh, uh, we have um, uh, uh, contact information, both uh, from MathWorks and from Otava, if you want to learn more about this model and this uh, effort. And uh, with this, I'd like uh, to pass the ball back to Luke, that will tell us everything about hardware. Thank you.